Hey everyone, it's your co-host Chuck Parson. As I'm sure most of you are painfully aware, this has been a devastating week for women's rights. At the time I'm recording this, several very restrictive anti-abortion bills are either being passed or presented in state legislatures in Georgia, Alabama, Missouri, Ohio, Kentucky, Arkansas, Utah, and Mississippi. Some of them so strict that they not only ban abortion, even in cases of rape and incest, but would exact murder charges against women for crossing state lines to get an abortion. Brady and I live in Missouri where a so-called heartbeat bill banning abortion after just eight weeks of pregnancy just passed in the House and is expected to be signed into law by the state's governor. It's terrifying, it's uninformed, and it's extremism. I mean, what do you even say? Brady and I are obviously both pro-choice. When we started the show, we honestly weren't sure if we wanted to get into the issue of abortion. We weren't sure what the climate would be like among our listeners. And at the time, it didn't seem like there would be big changes to it in the political world. So we just kind of put it on the back burner. But that was before the pro-life Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh were approved as Supreme Court justices. A lot has changed very quickly and very maliciously. In case anyone is confused about why this is happening right now, Republican congressmen in Republican-controlled states are rapidly passing illegal abortion laws, hoping that the resulting lawsuits against them will work their way up to the now-majority conservative Supreme Court, where they believe Roe v. Wade will be overturned. It's amazing to me that at some point in my life, I dreamed of this day. It's shameful and it's embarrassing, but I know all of you, our listeners, uh, will understand better than most. At one point, I was part of the machine that led up to this point in our history, this sick retrograde. But I guess most of us were at some point. The irony is that evangelicals who are largely responsible for everything that is happening surrounding women's rights didn't even care about abortion 30 or 40 years ago. It's quite a story. We have an episode coming down the pipe where we talk about the origins of the religious right, but the short version is that conservatism needed to mobilize a mostly politically apathetic evangelical population in order to regain political power. I mean, the Bible doesn't even address abortion, and don't even fucking Psalm 39 me. Reading abortion into that chapter is an extreme example of conclusion bias. The Christian God definitely doesn't care about abortion. But the sad, 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 sad irony is that that move has led us to this point where millions of women are losing their rights. <sighs> Abortion has never been an issue that the conservative establishment cared about, which is why nothing has ever really been done about it. But eventually, the monster they created mobilizing an incredibly self-righteous and determined evangelical population marked the death of reason in conservatism and paved the road that led to this moment. To quote conservative mega-icon Barry Goldwater way back in the 80s, quote, Mark my word, if any of these preachers get control of the Republican Party, and they're sure trying to do so, it's going to be a terrible damn problem. Frankly, these people frighten me. Politics and governing demand compromise, but these Christians believe that they are acting in the name of God, so they can't and won't compromise. I know I've tried to deal with them, end quote. But here we are, at seemingly lightning speed, women's rights are being taken away all over the country. In this very moment, millions of women do not have access to safe, legal abortion. I have some things I'd like to say, and I'd like to offer our audience a little bit of hope during this incredibly trying time. First of all, I'm sorry. As an ally, it's easy to convince myself that I've done enough because I don't feel the immediate danger the way women do in this country. We have limits as humans, obviously, but there's so much more that myself and other men and allies in this country could have done to fight this. Maybe it would have made a difference, maybe not. But the point is that when someone's rights are being threatened, like they have been, we need to fight for them in whatever capacity we can. So let's do better. I need to do better. As a big-time politics junkie, I want everyone to understand that while this is no small matter, there are currently, in the United States of America, millions of women who no longer have access to safe, legal abortion. This is fucking terrifying and real, but there are a lot of variables regarding what can happen from this point forward. First of all, you can't just pass an illegal bill and call it a day. All these bills will see lawsuits from organizations like the ACLU. Those lawsuits will be appealed to various circuit courts. These circuit courts more than likely will rule against these laws due to their obvious violation of the principle set in Roe v. Wade. So the only chance these bills have of standing is for the federal Supreme Court to fully overturn Roe v. Wade. And even though we're working with a majority conservative Supreme Court, that's still a pretty big obstacle. Most of these laws will be shut down prior to making it to the Supreme Court. 
They won't get the appeals they're depending on. And even if one does, there's a pretty strong chance that the Supreme Court won't even see the case because it's too politically charged, and the new justices don't want to be perceived as a political body. On top of that, Chief Justice John Roberts has said that, as a pro-life judge, he would rather chip away at Roe v. Wade than directly overturn it. Which is a terrifying statement in and of itself, but it's slightly less terrifying than Roe v. Wade just being fully overturned all at once. And obviously, Brett Kavanaugh famously stated that Roe was settled law, meaning that the Supreme Court shouldn't overturn it or even see a case that blatantly contradicts it. Now, obviously, Brett Kavanaugh is an entitled piece of human garbage, so whether he stands by that is to be determined. But at the end of the day, I feel like this full-fledged assault on abortion is a pretty harebrained plan, and I just don't think it's going to work. The fact of the matter is that somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of Americans oppose overturning Roe v. Wade, and that includes 55 percent of Republicans. And these state legislatures are trying to do just that at the start of an election cycle. I'm sincerely hoping, and this is entirely possible, that this is the religious rights Icarus moment. They just might be flying too close to their shitty version of the sun. For years now, Republicans have been using sketchy technicalities to get elected, wholly depending on evangelicals to get them there, legislating unpopular policy and repeating. It has become more and more clear that the Republican Party is pushing an extremist agenda supported by a small minority of evangelical religious activists, and they're going to lose people. And as the evangelical church slowly dies, these policies will die with it. This just might be the issue that ultimately causes them to collapse under their own weight. But fuck if they can't do a ton of damage on the way out. These real policies are affecting real people in this very moment, and no long-term victory can prevent that. But I think we have to have hope, and I think we can. But I just don't know. I really don't. I hope things will get better, and I think they will. I'm scared, and I know you probably are too. But even if I'm wrong, and none of that works, if we can't preserve a woman's right to choose, we'll, we go underground, we smuggle, we do what it takes to provide safe access to abortion, we fuck shit up, we mobilize, we do what we need to do to fix it, plain and simple. Start getting ready because a much bigger fight is coming. Until then, push back, protest, yell, cry, call your congressman, your governor. Don't stop, don't relent. Women in this country deserve to be free, and they will be. This is Chuck Parson. We have a great episode for you today, so don't go anywhere. Brady and I will be back after this. Quick note before we start this episode, anyone who listens to this show knows that we have a high standard for production quality. Unfortunately for this episode, it just wasn't possible to get the full audio quality that we usually strive to offer our audience. I'll spare you the boring details, but basically I was out of town and I had to leave in a rush so I didn't have time to get Brady a proper microphone, and it was the first time I'd used Skype's record feature, so I kind of missed the mark. But we shouldn't ever have this problem again, at least if I can help it. I worked some magic to make it easier to listen to, so I hope you all enjoy it anyway. As always, thank you for listening. Here is our interview with Nikki. This is Brady from The Life After, here at our headquarters (laughs) in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Chuck Parson, you come in? I'm right here. Uh, Chuck, uh, how are you doing? You're on location. I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, so we're doing a bit of a a bit of a makeshift uh, life after recording here. I'm in a, a bedroom in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Whoa. And Brady's in St. Louis, and uh, our guest today, Nikki, is in New Orleans. So we're just uh, we're living our best digital life right now. Oh, I like that. Our best digital life. <laughs> Nikki, uh, say hello to to everyone. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi um, from uh, my shed in New Orleans. Oh yeah, right. She's in a shed too because she's got to hide from her children. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is a horror movie. They, just wait. Yeah, right. They think she's. Yeah. They think she's like away, but she's actually just in the yeah. shed. 
<laughs> so they're, they're two and six, and they would be really, really excited to wreck our audio for this entire I bet they experience. would. I bet so they would. Yeah, for sure. They're, they're hanging out and getting spoiled with uh, with my friend. So. Cool. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining us today. I love it. You have to hide in the shed. (laughs) Nikki, um, I am kind of excited. Well, I'm very excited about interviewing, but one of the reasons is because you have a lot of very unique things in common from your backgrounds with me, and you have very unique things in common with Chuck. So you're kind of like a really... Like a mix between Chuck and I, but kind of cool and uh, not a not a guy. <laughs> so a so a cyborg, so a femme cyborg. Oh, yeah, I like this. Yeah, of the two of you. I like where this is going. Can we just do like cyborg fiction for the rest of the episode? I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I love it, uh, um, Nikki. What you had in common with me that I really appreciated was that you've done Hell Houses. Um, yeah, I didn't participate in one, but I attended, um, several years, like with my family, um, at, (laughs) at one that a local church did in the, the suburbs that I grew up in outside of New Orleans. Yeah. What do you remember from that shit? Um, like some of, some of the most raw terror that Mm. I've ever experienced in my life. Um, Mm. I remember just feeling truly horrified um and this particular one it wasn't it wasn't the kind of like hell house where you walk through scenes or walk through like simulating an actual haunted house it was a theatrical production it was a play in a um like a mega church sanctuary oh okay but it had the same basic concept um several different scenes of People were living a life apart from God, as as the church as that church would define it. So, um, folks who were gay or um, girl that had had an abortion. Um, but the most, the one that I remember most clearly was like an, an active school shooter scene, um, mm-hmm. where, and this was not very long. This was not very many years after Columbine, and it was very. Wow. Recent. Um, this was like 2001, like pretty, not, not too far after that act. Um, but very clearly drawing from that where there was like an actress who was the the Christian student who, um, refused to deny God. And like, she went to heaven and all these other, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these other characters who had been caught up in all these different types of sins went to hell. Um, right. And that just being like, acted out really viscerally with like really intense acting or like like remember um just the actors screaming at the top of their lungs um during like the shooting scene and then like the being dragged to hell scene um, oh my god oh there was a dragged to hell scene they took they, it that far they didn't like no one was actually dragged but there was like if if i'm remembering right it's like the the judgment is handed out and you are the audience understands that they're going to hell. I think like all the sure. lights go out possibly, but then you just like hear them screaming, like tormented screaming. Um, and wow. so I would have been early teens when I went to this with my family, like maybe 13 or 14. And so that was also right at the most intense part of my, um, of my like childhood OCD episodes and, and struggles. Mm. And so that was a huge thing that I fixated on and that I had panic attacks about. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, talk, so that was, that was something that you have, uh, mentioned to us. Uh, You have, so you have anxiety, OCD, uh, particularly at this stage in your life. I don't know if that's, I mean, I guess that's not something that really goes away, but, uh, can you talk a little bit about your, your church experience having anxiety and OCD and how like church culture sort of feeds into that? Um, or how, how it assisted in, in the development of that and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, so it's actually it's a, an interesting point you brought up about how like it never really goes away necessarily, because um, as an adult, that's been one of the 
biggest questions or like the things I've wrestled with about my mental health is, <clears throat> is what to say about it now, because mm -hmm. as a child in an evangelical expression of faith um, and having, having OCD, having like what my family called my worrying problem. Um, oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, they were really well intentioned, and they tried really hard um, to give me supports that they thought would help, and to to do, you know, what they thought was right for their daughter. And they they had no idea what it was. It was really bizarre to all of us. It was not something um, that, like, my family has a lot of folks in it with anxiety but not mm -hmm. necessarily with this type of anxiety with OCD. Um, and the things that I had intrusive thoughts about as young as nine years old were really upsetting adult things. Mm -hmm. um, like, like being scared that I was going to kill myself, even though I had no desire mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. um, or being scared that I was going to hurt myself. Um, being obsessed with checking the carbon monoxide detectors and the fire alarms in the house um, having just like classic stuff, like having to touch the doorknob 10 times before I left the house, um, things like that. They were like really upsetting to watch a 10 year old struggle with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. anyway, so like dealing with that in our church culture, this was a thing that I struggled with that I could be healed from. And so, wow that was the approach right was like like yes let's do these practical things to try to help as well my family and my church was not was not quite that skewed towards like the charismatic side where where all of our energy was just being poured into you know praying it away or like that type of healing necessarily but but it was a combination of like we're going to take these practical steps like taking you to see a trying these therapies or things to help but we're also going to pray about it all the time and and the end goal is that jesus is going to heal you from this and you're not going to have this anymore so i did see a significant decrease in my ocd symptoms and my anxiety around the middle of um like the beginning of high school when i was like 15 mm -hmm. 14 or 15 and and i've never struggled with it like i've never had symptoms that bad with ocd ever again except for two brief periods of time during like the first couple months of being postpartum with both of my kids mm -hmm. so oh, wow. okay. when you talk about it when you talk about it being like something that never really goes away that's been a real question of mine as an adult because when i was still a christian it was you know for a long time i would say that that like i I was healed from having OCD. OCD is not a thing that I associate with myself anymore. And it was a real wake up call when it like kind of came roaring back during that like postpartum anxiety phase. And I was all of a sudden like checking things and tapping things again. Um, except this time it was like my baby's crib, tapping that 10 times, um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. having to obsessively like wash the pacifier if it fell on the ground, like all the same stuff. Um, that I thought I had been healed from. So uh, now post-Christianity, it's something that I don't really know how to refer to anymore um, mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't struggle with it on a daily basis, but I'm realizing that there's a lot of things with my anxiety that I've never paid attention to, like all of the physical symptoms of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the, the, my approach to it when I was growing up and in a Christian household was all about like the thoughts. Sure. And I thought that yeah. if I could, can, if I can get my thoughts under control and if my thoughts were not crazy um, or irrational, then I must be fine. Sure. Because, mm. you know, I know that's something y'all have talked about on the show before that, like um, Christianity's dismissal of the body. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, the body is the flesh and it doesn't matter. And we don't really like, focus on that or that's not that's not where your soul resides sure so yeah i think i think now um i don't struggle with those ocd symptoms like i don't experience those at a high level but i kind of have all these low level constant um mm -hmm. physical symptoms that i've just been living with for a really long time mm -hmm. that i think i think if i 
try some other therapies or like try medication. Um, like maybe there's a better quality of life out there for me that I don't even, that I can't even envision for myself yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I like that. Um, so do you feel that like, so you, you associate your childhood OCD with, um, with the hell house, with the theology of hell. Was it, I mean, like there's obviously like a fear of death was part of that, um, mm -hmm. that sort of developed as a, as a, would you, I mean, would you say that that's like a direct, directly associated with the way Christianity approaches death and that conversation or? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's definitely like the, the concept of hell has always been, has always just seemed buck wild to me. Uh -huh. honestly, right. Yeah, else. absolutely. Um, just absolutely unfathomable. Yeah. And I realized pretty quickly that most of the people around me um, in my culture growing up did not seem to to stop and think about that concept as much as I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, it it stayed very intellectualized for them, and and not something that they seem to sit with uh, viscerally or emotionally, like to really sit and think about what eternal conscious torment would be. Um, yeah. Like I was thinking about that at eight years old, um, yeah. like more than any eight year old should. We found that we found that like a lot of the people that, that, that deconvert and a lot of the people that like, it's the people that really took Christianity seriously and really put a lot of thought into all the little like aspects of it that, or, or hurt the most by it or traumatized the most by it. Definitely, mm -hmm. like, it's easy for a lot of, I think most people, it's easy for them to go to church, hear about hell, say, well, I've accepted Jesus, so I'm not going there, so I don't really need to think about it, and then sort of move on. But, like, we, there are definitely people that, that fixate on it, and it, it tends to have a pretty intense effect on your, on your psyche, you know? Gray, were you going to say something? Yeah. I, I was thinking just to how... You know, people tell the gospel and how, you know, I was very much into evangelism. And so I was one of those who was trying to tell as many people as I could. But the way that hell kind of operates is a thing that we show you you're supposed to be, get scared. And we say, but don't worry, we have the solution. And then we're supposed to be able to sell that to you. So that, that time in between people getting that discomfort of initially hearing about hell, whether it's a kid or whatever, um, that time is supposed to be short. But I think some of us, we, we thought about it a little bit longer and we didn't just run and feel comfortable anymore because I think some of us are more empathetic. And so the real life implications of, well, what does that mean for everybody else? Um, is it fair that they have to burn in hell? Why do they, need, you know, all those things kind of start uh, circulating in your head and you start questioning it. And then, God, it just, it sounds so fucking crazy now looking back at right. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah how at peace we were with that. Oh yeah. People are just going to burn in hell for trillions and trillions and trillions of years. Like right. no big deal. Right? right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the whole concept of the great commission, um, played into my anxiety as well, like coupled with that hell theology. So like, not only is hell real and is eternal conscious torment, but guess what, buddy, it's your job. <laughs> It's like your job forever for the rest of your life to try to keep as many people um, from going there as possible. And, and that's like a, a responsibility that I felt at a really young age. And mm -hmm. um, I think looking back at like the, the types of obsessions and rituals I had um, all kind of had to do with a deep fear of what, my body and mind could be capable of and the mistakes it could be capable of making. Um, so like wow. the, like touching the doorknob 10 times before we left for school was about what if I'm the one that forgets to lock the door 
and like someone mm-hmm. comes in and steals all our stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, what if I'm the one that didn't see that the, you know, that the smoke detector was broken and there's a fire and we all die tonight. Right. Uh, so, right, right. yeah, um, that was, that so you had like a net, you had like a natural tendency towards like taking on too much responsibility and that applied to that applied to evangelism for sure. Right. Yeah. Tell yeah, us a little bit about your, so you use the phrase contact evangelism. Um, mm-hmm. w- w- uh, explain to me what that, what that meant and like how it, it was, it sounds like it was pretty essential to your like approach to evangelism or Christianity. Right. It was pretty central. Yeah. It, I didn't do it um, super often because I hated it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, we, we all did. <laughs> it, it was it terrible. It was definitely um, part of several uh, like church cultures that I was a part of. Most of them during my college, during my like undergraduate college experience when I was in campus ministry. Um, so, yeah, it was just it was framed as like this is a type of ministry that is really important um, because. Because why wouldn't you? Like, why why wouldn't you? If if all of this is true, then why wouldn't you want to have these conversations with strangers? And isn't this the most important thing that you could possibly talk to anyone about? Um, and yeah, so I, I've been in like a couple of little like seminars and classes about how to do contact evangelism, like how to have these really forced artificial conversations um so much so that like i can usually recognize them really quickly and Mm -hmm. and this past year like finally had i was wondering how long it would take but finally (laughs) had an experience where i was on the other end of that karma isn't that creepy it's creepy (laughs) yes um it was really weird and i i like I knew like 15 seconds into the conversation, what was happening. Um, and yeah, it was just yeah, of course. Flooded with, and the, the sad part was looking at these two people's faces who were, um, yeah. looked to also be college undergrads and like seeing, like they hated it too. Like I could see it right, right in right, their right. eyes that like they were deeply uncomfortable mm-hmm. doing this thing. Um, but they felt so compelled yeah. by their religion that this is something they needed to do for my benefit and for theirs, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that they could feel like they're fulfilling the great commission and they can feel like they are, um, potentially saving someone from hell. Yeah. Yeah. So, I can imagine yeah. them like sitting there thinking like, like having an internal <laughs> conversation with God where God is like, go tell that girl about Jesus. And, you're, and they're like, no, nah, I don't want to. And, and God's like, I'm going to convict you with the Holy Spirit. And then they start feeling butterflies in their stomach and they're like, no, nah, I don't want to do it. But I know the Holy Spirit and this is it. I have to get yeah. to it. <laughs> it's a terrible process of like trying to get, find a way out of it. But then like, for some reason, your intuition is like, you have to do this right now, you know? <laughs> but I was the yeah. same way as you, you, you have that feeling I, I remember very specifically like going on mission trips with my youth group and it was supposed to be the time to just like chill out and hang out. But I felt so convicted that I had to go speak to a group of homeless people or something like that. But that's how like my everyday life was is if I had this feeling, if I can come up with a creative way to do a good thing, I felt like I was obligated to do that. I had to do that because if I wasn't, then I wasn't listening to God. And then there's that whole like obsession of, am I going to be obedient enough or not? And uh, uh, God, it's just like that constant cycling bullshit. Mm -hmm. And it Mm -hmm. never felt like you could do enough. And you never knew if what you were doing was enough because we don't really know for sure what the standard is until after we're dead. Right. So, Ugh, I hated it. Yeah, the that whole like internal monologue that that you're describing um, was really 
like, I think I, I spoke about this in when we were emailing, but that's like, I think my biggest wound that I've taken away from a, a Christian upbringing is like an inability to decipher my, my true inner voice. Um, you know what? Can we actually, let's touch on that right when we get back from a break, because I fucking love talking about inner voice shit. And this is going to be a longer conversation. So we'll be right back right after this. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> and we're back. We're back. This is Brady, this is Brady Harden. Uh, I'm with Chuck me. Carson. And also with me is... Nikki. Hey, Nikki. Nikki. <laughs> hey. Um, okay, so inner voice I think is hella interesting because I, when I was younger, I put such an emphasis on my thoughts because, you know, we're supposed to hold every thought captive. You're talking about childhood OCD. Um, I have some similarities to what you're describing in one way or another. But when I was a kid, holy shit, I thought that my thoughts were so important because if it was a negative thought, that was temptation. And I had to fight against that. And I just circulated and I became fucking obsessed with my inner voice. Didn't really know if it was me or the Holy Spirit or what the hell was going on. What the hell is the deal with the fucking inner voice and crazy <laughs> evangelical what's, yeah. what's going on? Is that like a... Um like a Jerry Seinfeld stand up like like what is the what is deal? The, what is what the deal? Is the deal with what, inner voice. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I had <laughs> I had similar um, similar confusion about it as compounded by uh, childhood OCD and anxiety um, because the the methods that I was being taught in my church about how to access that inner voice and like how to find out what God is telling you was essentially to like sit still and, and try to clear your mind and like, listen for what pops into your head when you ask a question about like what God oh, wants you to do. Mm -hmm. Like very. Um, and so, you know, for other people that seemed to work fine when I did that, the voice would say like, like, shut that car door five more times or mm -hmm. until it feels right, or it's going to blow up mm. is what's going to uh, happen. Oh, right, and right, right. that didn't wow. seem like God. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I was in a position where like my inner voice couldn't always be trusted um, and was mm. sometimes irrational. And then I had, so I felt like, I felt like I had several competing voices in my head because I would have like, the irrational thoughts from OCD and anxiety. I would have um, indoctrinated thoughts where I would convince myself that that was my inner voice at work um, and, and try to act on that. And then I would have what I would identify now as like my real inner voice, the voice that would like caution me when things started to not make sense in Christianity or not line up. Um, the voice that would make me hesitate before doing some of the things that I really don't believe in anymore, like contact evangelism. Um, and the voice that like, you know, told me that I could definitely like girls as much as I liked boys. And, mm -hmm. um, like that was, that's all what I would say is my real inner voice now. But at the time, it was really hard to differentiate. Um, sure. and I spent mm. a lot of my prayer life trying to discern who was who in my head. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird because we were taught to not trust our hearts, but also taught to listen to every fucking word it said and and obsess over mm -hmm. it. Right. All right. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, that balance yeah, is so hard. That's to really find. that's really true. Yeah, I mean, it's like you had to, you ha- sort of had to have this like immediate filter, right? Like because your thoughts are just running and running and running and running. Most of them are completely meaningless. So you're like, you're having to filter everything. Is like, is that my very evil self that's talking? Is that you know some kind of like spiritual evil spiritual influence, or is it God? Or is it some, you know, messenger from God? Or is it just gibberish that synapses in my brain are firing? And you're like, every thought you have that you're conscious of, you have to, like, run it through that filter. It's super exhausting, right? And but I mean, it's like, just when you have ego. OCD, you have to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, just balancing those two voices is enough, you know? <laughs> like, not having to balance, yeah. like... Is this a good or bad voice? Is this God's voice? Is it my voice? Is it my OCD? You know, um, it's like the clumps. You know, you find <laughs> out it. It's all just Eddie Murphy with a wig on. <laughs> you know, it's just your. It's just your ego using all these different voices, saying just <laughs> sitting at the same goddamn table, saying shit. You know, I never. Uh, yeah, no, I. I never thought that movie would have any like worldview, like like relevant implications to me, but. Uh, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> but no, I mean indoctrination. Indoctrination takes our our ego. The theme is just constantly saying thoughts and observations. This never ending voice, which everything it says, you know, is gone in a moment. A lot of it's just absolute bullshit. Some of it's very important; it should be listened to. But indoctrination just kind of like forces to take a lot of those thoughts and then to put a hat on them and then mm-hmm. push them on stage and make them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. perform and i think it yeah. allowed us it allowed right, some of us to just um to kind of get wrapped up in trying to interpret those things become obsessed with interpreting is this from satan you know and then yeah. god that just all gets so creepy and yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah that was a good one is this from satan was it like <laughs> yeah yeah that's another voice yeah especially uh, it was just very crowded in there right so okay, it's like so the you United States of Terra. say that again, Brady. It's like United States of Terra, like that the show where she's got identify DID disassociative identity disorder. Oh right, you right, have right. all these different characters, you know, that are coming from the same. I don't know. I'm just making. I'm making movie TV, and TV references. TV references. I don't know if you know what that else about is new, me. Brady. What else That's is all new? I'm good for. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so speaking of, of inner voices and knowing yourself, you, you sort of mentioned in there that you like girls. So you were a queer per- person. Uh, yeah, uh, when did you, when did you start to realize that? Where were you in your church life? Um, and how did all of this inner voice stuff play into that? When and why did you well, choose? It's really, to be- <laughs> yeah, right. it's really all, um, it's all Christianity's fault. I blame. I blame it. Um, they, <laughs> Christian Eve theology hot, gave right? me. Christian theology gave me my queerness. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But it, it. My my queerness is innate within me. I I came into the world with that identity. But I do remember. Um, tagging it, like acknowledging it as a as a conscious thought and a a thing, through. Uh, Christian theology being explained to me. So particularly like how I was supposed to approach finding a partner, finding a husband, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, was explained to me like very, like you, you're looking for someone that you can be compatible with. Like you should not, um, you shouldn't look at the outward appearance of people. That's not important. Again, like we're not really acknowledging, you know, the body is not important. The flesh is not important. It's our spirits that are important. So you should look for a partner that is equally yoked with you, that, um, you know, that loves God with the same passion that you do, that you can be um, partners with, that you can be, since, since I'm a woman, I can be a helpmate to. Um, Oh boy. Almost immediately the, the thought in my head, well, if the outward appearance doesn't matter, I think this was before I even knew what sex, I'm pretty sure this was like six or seven years old. Like, I don't even know what intercourse is at all well Mm -hmm. well, like can't couldn't i just as conceivably find that connection with a girl as well as a boy Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and the answer was very quickly no you cannot right (laughs) you definitely can't do that (laughs) that's not a thing um 
and so kind of shoved that thought down for a while, but it never went away. Um, mm. and realized just, just kept, so, you know, it was, it was a question when I was like really, really little, like, couldn't this be a thing? Like, why couldn't this be a thing for me or for anyone? Why is this wrong? Why is this bad? Um, I remember getting in huge trouble when I was about eight because I had learned at school what, what a lesbian was. Mm. And I had told, um, I had told my cousin before and without my mom's permission to tell her what that was. And her mom had not had a chance to talk to her about it. Sure. And I just remember it being a really big deal. And it was like a really bad word and a really bad thing. Mm. Um, okay. And so, yeah, as I like got older and went through, through middle school, like through middle school and high school, eventually came around to a certainty that I'm definitely bisexual, mm -hmm. but that's unfortunate because mm -hmm. that's sinful. Yeah. So, right. um, so I'm struggling with same sex attraction. Um, right. yeah. And Brady's favorite and phrase. <laughs> it was really typically for most of my life, I, would consider myself a really self-aware person, but this was an area where looking back, I see so many things I did that I was not aware at the time were super gay. I was not aware at the time was me like test driving, like testing this part of my identity to see what, what people would accept and what people would reject. So for example, like I remember um, in middle school writing letters, because this is a time when I like, people actually still wrote like handwritten letters to my friend um, and signing them with like X's and O's and hearts. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I remember um, eventually getting a, a talk about oh, that from no. my parents about how, how people, people might misinterpret that. Oh my God. And that's not really an appropriate um, way to sign a letter to another girl. Mm, so I was yeah. like, okay, I think, like subconsciously, I was like, okay, that went too far. Can't do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And then later in high school, I, I remember taking my best friend, who I totally had a crush on, um, as my, my like friend date to a homecoming dance. Mm -hmm. And I remember being really, con like just look, scanning the room. And this was a Baptist high school. Mm -hmm. um, Ugh. I remember like scanning the room the whole night and just kind of taking in people's reactions and, and, processing them and like I remember taking like we took a picture together in the you know like the, the photo booth thing dances. oh yeah okay yeah um that's just really funny to look back on now yeah like, yep you are really queer um, were you big spoon or little spoon in the picture <laughs> um in that friendship I probably would have been uh probably would have been big spoon in that okay. friendship okay <laughs> okay Good. okay there we go <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a spoon switch. It's, right. It good. just depends on the dynamic. That's great. I, um, uh, yeah, I'm kind of a spoon switch. Nikki, myself. did you ever find yourself like having confusing feelings while looking at a Point of Grace album or anything <laughs> like that? Um, oh, I mean... It was it was Jennifer Knapp, obviously. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, we literally just really interviewed good. her. Yeah. You and Chuck both, actually. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We both had a little bit of a crush on Jennifer yeah. Knapp. <laughs> that's For really sure. funny that you you. That's funny that you said that. We I don't know if you we told you this, but we just interviewed her. Like. <laughs> no, I didn't week. know that. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, what kind of what wait? Kind wait, of hold on. I have oh, a question. Sorry. So, oh. can we just, I, or maybe it's just a statement? Don't give me that face, Brady. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you, know, you could see it. Um, okay. There's this that that whole thing about like, uh, like, you know, we don't like when you were writing notes to your friend. It's like you people might get the wrong idea, right? Like, yeah, how right. big how big and annoying is that in Christianity in general? Like. It usually in terms of sexuality is the time that it comes up, but it comes up in all kinds of different things. Like Paul sort of saying like, you know, avoid the appearance of, or is it Peter? I can't remember. Uh, avoid the appearance of evil or whatever. Um, yeah. and, and it's like, yeah, no, you can't like show affection for your best friend because we don't want you to look gay to 
somebody that's never going to see those letters. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hate it. Yeah. It was a lot of that. And it was interesting because people sometimes are surprised when they, like people that I, I've met as adults and people that I've met post-Christianity are sometimes surprised when they start to realize like how deeply rule following I am. You mm-hmm. Like it's really in my nature to rule follow and to respect mm-hmm. authority because I don't look like a person that does that. I, you got big holes in your ears. Because I have, I have like lots of body modifications. Um, yeah. and I, I look fairly alternative. I don't know. Like I, I make, yeah. I make decisions about my appearance that don't follow rules. But again, I think it, it just goes back to that deep instillment that like, it's your heart that matters. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, and I never really got like to, to my upbringings credit, I guess, and to my church culture's credit, no one ever really came down on me hard about how I looked, um, the amount of the like excessive amount of jewelry and bracelets I was wearing. Um, no one had a problem with that. People didn't really have a problem when I started getting tattooed. Um, but but that appearance that something might be uh, not appropriate about my heart mm-hmm. and about my actions um, and about whether I was or wasn't following um, following God's path for me, like that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. That's where um, that's where I found those hard boundaries um, within my my church about like what I what I could and couldn't get away with. Um, yeah. And it took me a really, a really long time to push past any of them. Mm, yeah. So you are deconstructed. You are out, uh, as, uh, pansexual. Is that correct? Yeah. That's, I okay. usually say queer. Um, sure. Like okay. Pan, pan is also accurate. Okay. Yeah. Can you define uh, pansexual? And you, you're, you have a couple of kids and you're married and you're still married. So how did, how did yeah. that work out? <laughs> Um, so that's a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> that's a lot for of a stuff. marriage to yeah. endure. Yeah. Oh, hey, Brady, you define pain sexual while you're at it. Please. Yeah. So, um, as, as I've heard most people define it and how, how I would define it for me is that, um, I'm attracted to all gender expressions. Um, there's no gender expression that I am not theoretically attracted to. Um, and really for me, it, it, it does circle back to that, that core Christian concept that I'm, I'm looking to connect with the heart of a person, um, whether that's platonic or romantic, like that's, that's kind of thing number one for me. And, and everything else is secondary to that. So how did the, how did the process of, of coming out and deconstructing and like uprooting the foundational tenets of your entire life how does a a marriage survive that Um, (laughs) in your in your humble opinion i know you don't have like a a universal answer for (laughs) (laughs) fix our marriages (laughs) i'm very often like my husband mark and i talk about this a lot that like we'll just be talking about things, um, related to, to Christianity or to faith or to, um, being agnostic now, um, and just kind of like look at each other every now and then be like, it, it is insane that our marriage not only survived this, but, but got a million times better. Like Mm -hmm. we're even more committed to each other. Like you're even more my soulmate now that we have gone through this journey together. Um, and so of like, I guess the context there is that I <clears throat> deeply rule following, although not looking like it, went through college and my campus ministry and um, started getting more and more, uh, more and more leftist, like m- less and less conservative um, and started falling in with like the kind of social justice warrior, left leaning, um, mm-hmm. Christian set the, the Shane Claiborne followers. Of oh, the Shane Claiborne. That's a name that um, has not come up very much on the show yet, which will be really interesting. And we went through phases for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I met my husband through like on the internet <laughs> through 
Cool. Me <laughs> posting, yeah, me posting a blog, um, trying to reach out to like that network of people to see who was interested in starting an intentional Christian community with me. Oh yeah. In downtown New Orleans. Very um, cool. And Mark was already living in uh, one such community in Nashville at the time where he's originally from Louisiana, but was uh, got displaced to Tennessee after Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. Mm. Oh, okay. And was, yeah, ended up living there for, for several years after that. So he contacted me. We started talking about like intentional Christian community stuff and, and then just kept talking and kept talking and kept talking and realized we liked each other and then realized we loved each other, yada, yada. Um, and so we started an intentional Christian community house before we actually got married. Um, we lived in both sides of a, of a new Orleans shotgun style house. Sure. Um, and so before we were married, it was like girls on this side of the house and guys on this side of the of house. And then that, got shot to shit when we got married we had to rearrange everything but yeah. um yeah so i got married at 23 and he was 24 and Whew. yeah and we um had our first kid when i was 26 and i would say i i came out to him as bisexual like i don't know maybe a year into our marriage and his reaction was and his response is basically like yeah, Nikki, like I know. Um, that's <laughs> cool. That's cool. Pretty obvious in a number of ways. You're right, um, right, right. That's fine. Um, Mark has always been less dogmatic than me and uh -huh. way more comfortable with ambiguity and way more comfortable with, um, with uh, sitting in the tension of not having all the answers. Sure. And Ooh. so that didn't bother me, bother him or scare him nearly as much as it did me. Um, so then like the spiritual deconstruction kind of started, uh, a year or two after that, after the, the Christian commune kind of crumbled as many of them are wont to do. <laughs> and what? We, to, we had to pick up our lives and like get real jobs, um, to support our baby that we were having, mm. um, and Mark let go of of the, you know, what he thought at the time was the calling to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know y'all have talked about that a lot about like the, the existential crisis about vocation mm -hmm. post Christianity or post like being in ministry. And mm -hmm. he definitely, yeah. definitely had that. So yeah, basically he, he's been with me for the whole process and all I can attribute intactness the the thriving of our marriage through all that is just like a deep a deep commitment to communication and honesty with each other and um and a commitment to like just walk this thing through um mm -hmm. we've we've held true to that and that's like served us really well so mark mark's deconstruction i think at the beginning was maybe like like a year year and a half behind mine <laughs> um but then it kind of caught up and, mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe even zoom past me. Like mm -hmm, he's, mm -hmm. he's tossed out the word atheist, uh, several times and I'm Look not out, quite folks. there. <laughs> so so yeah, now we, we came out on the other side together. Um, and with two kids now and I'm 32 now, so we're almost a decade into this thing. Yeah. Uh, Wild. Yeah. Very cool. It's so cool. I love that. Um, well, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I want to go back a little bit and ask you about that intentional community because uh, that was, sure. I was, uh, yeah, I was there. I was right there. <laughs> uh, we'll be back. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you Stop. Would... Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to thelifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> Thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right. Thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back to The Life After. Uh, you all don't know this, but because I get to record in my living room, I get to sit by my, my cat today. 
My cat Link, Link is here in the studio. Link. Give us a meow, Link. Hey, you know what? Actually, I'm going to get one of his treats now. See if I can give him the meow for the show. Okay, there we here, go. You guys let's, talk. I'll be right back. Let's give it a... Uh, okay, so... <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> Everybody is uh, on the edge of their seats with anticipation. Um, so, Nikki, uh, so you were... So, okay, let me just... I'll, I'll give a little intro myself here. So, I was exposed to uh, a, a, a very famous New York Times bestseller called The, the Irresistible Revolution. Uh, probably in, I'm going to guess, for me, it was like 2006 or 2007. Yeah, so I, I read this book, and I was the first person in my... So I was like a, a, an influential Christian, right, in my, in my group of, of Christian people. I can uh, verify he was, he was. I was, yeah, and, and I, uh, I was the first person in my friend group to read this book, and I just started, like, fucking preaching it. Like, I mean, I got mm -hmm. really... I got way too into it, and my friends got way too into it, and there was this, like, I don't know, years long, probably one or two years long dialogue about about intentional community, about vows of poverty, um, about n new monasticism. Um, eventually, I got into real monasticism, which I found a lot more substantial. Substantial, but um, I, yeah. So I I was like I was like preaching that irresistible revolution stuff. I was trying to figure out ways to finance, like purchasing a building trying to figure out how that would work logistically. I had a lot of people on board. I mean, I basically, like, looking back, it was like, I was trying to start a cult, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> in a really weird way. I mean, I was trying to start, like, a like a, a, a not super authoritative cult, but I, you know, there would have had to be, there would have had to have been all these rules. There would have been a really awkward, like, leadership structure that would have involved me that it wouldn't have worked because I would not have, like, played that role well. Um, there's so much there and, and we haven't talked about this on the show at all. So I'm super interested in what your experience is like, because mine was like super messy. And in hindsight, all I can say about it is that I'm really glad it never actually happened. <laughs> but, yeah. So, um, what's monasticism? I'm sorry. Monasticism is like monks, monk living, uh, prayer life, um, uh, not like not owning things or like owning things like jointly uh like i mean that's the monastic tradition going back like thousands of years is like you take a vow of poverty or silence you go live somewhere you share everything you have like okay. a really strict routine and your whole purpose is to serve other people in some way whether it's through prayer or action or you know some kind of in this case like there was a heavy in, uh, influence or uh, uh, emphasis on social justice on you know protecting the homeless, on standing up for the homeless, um, you know standing up against systems of of power, uh, political power, um, all of those kinds of things. So the, just to you know like yeah, put that out there. Anyway, Nikki, tell tell me about <laughs> tell me about that because like yeah. half of our audience is like oh my god, and the other half is like I have no idea what this is. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> So very similarly, um, I also read that book. Um, oh, really? I'm so surprised. I also read that book, and so had Mark. Um, I think we had both read it by the time we met um, and started talking, but I, or it might have been right after it. I can't really remember. A lot of that time is a blur. Looking back on it, I think so much of it, like the reason – you probably got so stoked on it and I got so stoked on it and all of this, these people got so stoked on it. Um, for me, it, w it was a lot about like reading ideas in this book and concepts in this book that ran true with, with my inner voice and with my yeah. sense of like morality um, yeah. and being excited that I could maybe find a way to make this fit with, with my yes. beliefs. Oh like, yeah. Okay, yeah. Maybe this is a way that I can um, merge all of this together into something cohesive. Like maybe this is finally, maybe if I just memorize this book and how they talk about these concepts, then I can be okay with a God that sends people to hell somehow. Mm -hmm. Like maybe this will be enough to go on and I won't have to actually leave my faith and leave, you know, and by extension, like, sever the most important 
bond that I have with like most of the people in my life. Um, mm. So that's like why we were all really stoked on it is because we thought it could be the thing that fixes the dog. Mm. That's um, interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, at that point I had like eliminated a lot of, a lot of the like sort of fundamentalist dogma in my life. I think the thing that was really got me into it and that's definitely what you just said is definitely a huge part of it was like this reconciling my worldview with my actual you know moral sense but uh a big part of it was just like this is like a big thing for me was like what like how are american christians like different from normal people right like we go to church and we tell people they're going to hell but for the most part we are we live pretty much like very similar lives and i was looking for something like way more radical that required like, you know, it, like really radical trust in God that required like, it, where it was like, people will look at this, they, people will look at what we're doing and say like, oh, I think God probably definitely exists because this shouldn't work, right? It like financially or, you know, communally or otherwise, it was like, okay, God is going to, like, this is my opportunity to like give all of the control to God to, to, to surrender myself to like not lean on my own understanding, right? Not like go through college, get a job, make a comfortable living, buy a house in the suburbs, et cetera. It was like the opposite of all of that, which, you know, like scared the shit out of me and like felt very contradictory to the message of scripture, right? So uh, that was that was like a big part of it for me was like this radical difference, you know, from like normal everyday life, right? Um, yeah, that was... That was a big part of it for me as well. Um, the like anti-consumerism of mm -hmm. it, the um, anti-materialism. Again, like just putting all of those things aside, and I could focus even more on my my spiritual development. And like, it's it's so hard to put into words. Like, it was a lot about that um, about that radical difference about like finally finding a, a community of people, like finally being able to participate in some sort of church, even if it was this, like this gutter punk house church. Sure. Um, yeah. Where I just didn't feel like the weird one. Yeah. Um, or the, yeah. the one that was taking it the most seriously. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a bit. Where, yeah, for sure. Where everyone, you know, everyone was probably the kid that thought about hell too much when they were eight. Sure. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I was that, like, get me out of this suburban Baptist church where nobody is interested in like the radical message of Jesus and get me into a community where people take this really seriously. Yeah, that was a big part yeah. of it. We had such good intentions with that. And I think so many Christian communities that were in this movement really did. But also like the thing, a thing that I think about a lot was how how harmful those like missions could still be um, because a, a lot of times it ended up and in our case, like definitely ended up looking like a bunch of white suburban 22, 23 year olds mm. moving into a working class neighborhood um, in new Orleans. It was definitely working class neighborhoods, majority people of color and, um, and just, just really gentrifying them is what ended mm -hmm. up happening. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't even know that term at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Strangely absent from the, uh, the irresistible right. revolution. Suspiciously. suspiciously. <laughs> um, but like definitely contributing to gentrification and definitely, uh, like bringing in, bringing white saviorism, um, mm -hmm. like subconsciously, no one, I, I don't think anyone consciously thought that, but that's yeah. definitely what it was. Absolutely. And I think yeah. that was, um, like really harmful. It's something I have deep regrets about now, mm -hmm. um, the way that we went about that and, um, and have like a lot of like lingering suspicion of, of communities like that now for those reasons. Oh, yeah, uh, Cause sure. I just rarely, rarely have seen it be functional and be healthy for the people in them and the, the neighbors of the people in them. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that was like, that was that. I mean, it, it so, really didn't last that long. We, we lived in the house with kind of a rotation of, of housemates who were in this, this community, um, for about a year where we actually pooled all of our income. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And now, you know, did had, you did you like rope all this together? Was this your? Did you initiate this or? I mean, in a way, kind of like in the in the sense that it was it was my uh, my blog post about like wanting to start this mm-hmm. that started Mark and I's conversation. But then we very quickly got like three three or four other folks who are really invested in starting it as well. And then it was kind of a group sure, effort. For sure. yeah. um, but Mark, you know, Mark was the person in the group who had, uh, had a pastoral calling. Mm-hmm. And so he, you know, we ended up having a, a church component of that community. That mm-hmm. was a house church okay. um, that he, you know, he was the pastor of, and we had like, delusions of that being financially viable sure yeah 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 <laughs> sort of, of course way. well yeah um, god is gonna take care of it so yeah. god well you only need 10 people to give their tenth, right yeah and so yeah. uh for a year it was just basically like a a lot of uh, like 21 to 25 26 year olds living in this house trying to like live this this uh, book out basically and working a a rotation of service industry jobs of varying Mm -hmm. amounts of hours per week in order to make ends meet and like dumpster diving a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Um, 21 me is just like so excited right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We we did a lot of dumpster diving and I only, I only had the balls to do it a few times, but it was, I was so fulfilled by those few times of dumpster diving. (laughs) Oh, I was I was way too excited about it and like yeah. way too proud of it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But also like deeply rule following me horrified while we were doing it. Like of terrified. Course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That someone that some sixteen year old that works at the grocery store is gonna take the trash out and find us <laughs> as if it would, <laughs> as if it would have been any sort of big deal. Yeah. But um but yeah, so that, that part lasted about a year and then after that part after it kind of fell apart officially, we continued trying to live intentionally with the people that remained. Um, so it kind of moved from that that actual pooling our income model to Mark, who owned the house, to us kind of just like living on one side of the house because we were married at that point and having a couple of other folks uh, live on the other side of the house, either for like a small, a really small amount of rent or at different times, like no rent. And just with the, the idea that we were more than roommates, like we were more than housemates. We were going to like live life together and we would share meals a lot and, um, you know, share groceries sometimes just like try to be, be a community with each other. And that was like, that was a, a much more successful uh, model like a, sure. a much more sustainable model than than that first year yeah um, but even that is like not without its tensions and without its like drama um so what would you say were the what were the uh, so you mentioned like for the first year you you pulled income what were some of the like like sort of strange alternative tenants that you you had to that that set that you guys felt set you apart as a community. I mean, you might have mentioned most of them already. I don't know, but I was just kind of trying yeah, to like rail um, them off at one time just to kind of give people an idea. So we definitely, I mean, we definitely had some some purity culture ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, ashamedly, we definitely you know would not like I mentioned before we were married. There was a girl side of the house and a guy side of the house. Yeah, yeah. So super into the gender binary at that point, I guess. Sure, and, sure. um, so we wouldn't, I guess there was, we wouldn't have allowed, um, unmarried folks to be like sharing bedrooms or like living mm-hmm. on the same side of the house. Right. But um, you were like queer, so it really didn't make any difference anyway. Right. Yeah. Loophole. <laughs> eternal loophole. Um, <laughs> God, it, it's just really, it's really cringy now. It really is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh no. I, we, I feel, no, I totally feel that. Yeah. We had, um, at one point I remember having a rule that we weren't going to have, that we weren't going to have alcohol in the house because, um, someone in the house had identified that as, uh, as an area that they struggled with, mm-hmm. um, with like substance abuse. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that, that was like one of the less harmful ones. Like that was pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Glad, I'm glad that we did that. Uh-huh. 
yeah, so there was a lot of that, like kind of making decisions as a group about what values we were going to hold and what we were and weren't going to like have in the house or participate in things like that. We, it was always kind of a struggle defining rules about money because Mm -hmm. income was so varied all the time. And some people had trouble finding work and some people uh, were working way too much and some people had higher salaries than others. And yeah, so like rules about money were difficult. Everyone bitched at everyone else about the dishes. I think that's like the one common thread of yep. all yep. Yep. community yep. houses is that like <laughs> deep, deep resentments will build up about the mm. dishes and who is doing their fair share of them and who isn't. So, if I were to say gray water system, would you know what I was talking about? Oh yeah, we definitely did that. Yeah, I was gonna say I was gonna oh ask everybody everybody had the fucking gray water. I completely, completely so, blocked that out. Yeah, totally. So for those of you that don't know what this is, gray, a gray water system is where like you basically you tr- you're trying to minimize your water use. So you, uh, you, you if it's yellow, let it mellow usually. And, um, huh? and you, you sort of collect like sink water um, instead of it going into the pipes, it, it gets collected into like a bucket of some sort that you can then use to flush the toilet. So you're not using fresh water all the time to do like stuff you don't need fresh water for. And it's super gross and unsanitary. <laughs> it's super gross. It smells awful. Yeah, it I smells remember bad. Mark's, Mark's community house in Nashville at one point had mushrooms growing in the bathroom. Yes. Of course um, it oh my God. <laughs> and there becomes, there becomes this kind of weird um, pride about how grimy things can get. Yep. Yep. Um, this weird like badge of honor of uh-huh. like how how punk you can be like I'm yeah. so punk that I'm growing mushrooms unintentionally in my bathroom. Uh-huh. Um, there was well, it was showing your intentional community. It yeah. was weird how we yeah right. <laughs> it was weird how we how there was like this extreme crossover with like secular crust punk culture that nobody was acknowledging for some reason. Like it was like, yes. you guys are crust punks, but for, like for Jesus, but you're just calling it something else, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so many dogs, so many and dogs. dogs yeah. House. Dogs with bandanas. Mm-hmm. Dogs yeah. with bandanas. Um, so <laughs> many pit bulls. We yeah. had like, not that this was because it was a pit bull necessarily, but, um, but I do remember like two dogs getting in a really bad fight oh my in, God. in our backyard. Like <laughs> that was a horrifying memory. Um, like yeah. some, some kids that, who was not in our, in our actual community, he was just like staying for a couple days. That happened yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a rotating, yeah. Like, yeah. like resident wanderer and, usually. Yeah. And he had, um, he had a dog who was really aggressive and he knew that he was really aggressive, um, like could not take this dog around kids, couldn't, dog could not be around other dogs and, oh God. which seems really inconvenient for someone that's like living traveling all the time. Lifestyle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and we had at the time, like a, a puppy, almost an adult, but like a puppy pit bull mix that we, like a stray that we adopted. And, and somebody let him out accidentally at the same time in the backyard and they immediately fought. Um, I remember Mark had to like, Mark had to separate them. Like all these people were trying to separate them. And I remember one, uh, one crust punk girl (laughs) immediately going and sticking her finger in the butt of the aggressive dog (laughs) and saying, (laughs) because because she either had been told or maybe had tried this tactic out. And she was like, if you stick your finger in their butt, they freak out and they stop fighting the other dog. Um, and I think it worked for a second. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but that's definitely happened. I'd be like, I have a thing in my butt. Now I'm going to fight everyone <laughs> here. <laughs> um, that's incredible. That's a really weird. That's really weird. That's hilarious. Yeah. It was really weird. It was like... So I just want to stop the show for a second because we looked this up and apparently this is a real thing. I don't... I mean, I'm not going to say like go out there and 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 like search for a dog fight and see what happens, but apparently this is like a, a piece of lore. If you stick your finger in a dog's butt, it might stop fighting. 
It's on Google. I don't know, dude. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But it's the thing that happened, um, and the aggressive dog still, like, hurt our dog really badly. Oh, man. And it was just, it was one of those moments, and I had a lot of them. Um, maybe you had one about the gray water system. I don't know. Mm-hmm. One of those moments where, like, <laughs> when the rubber meets the road, I realized how deeply suburban I actually am. Because <laughs> I was like, Oh no, like we are taking this dog to the uh-huh. 24 hour vet in the suburbs where my uh-huh. parents take their dog. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it's going to cost $400, which it did. And yeah. We're, we're, we're going to get this dog stitched up and we're going to go into debt over it because that's apparently who I am deep inside. And I'm not going to like, I'm not going to wait 24 hours for like the, the, the one vet in the quarter that kind of helps out street <laughs> kids' dogs. Like, I'm not going to do that. That's a really good point because I, you like, so I went from, I mean, like I was still sexually repressed. Right. But then I turned into financially repressed because of that Uh whole movement. Right. Where I was like, so in denial about how I wanted to use my currency, you know, like for Mm -hmm. me, like you said, Mm -hmm. uh, you said, you know, you had that moment where you, you realized how suburban you actually are. For me, it was like every time I passed the Apple store and was like, man, I really like technology a lot. (laughs) Uh (laughs) And would be like, this is a temptation. Like I need to get away. My, my Shane Claiborne phase looked different than your guys's. Um, I kind of went through one because I took the Bible so serious and I always went back to the whole verses about the rich young ruler, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and I just now after listening to this, Chuck, I realized that me getting to Shane Claiborne was probably a wave from you that like, I think it trickled through some of our friends. Ryan Carpenter. Yeah. 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 That's definitely. Shout out Ryan Carpenter. Hey. Um, So I read, those I read his books, um, and a lot of my friends were, you know, a lot of us on the other side of our little friends island. We were wanting to do like an intentional community thing, but I realized that like I was kind of uh, in the B string, like the B team. <laughs> oh no, the, it's so cute, Brady. Oh, Brady. <laughs> like was... real life aquatic, you were B squad. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> Because I was like the weird um, one who's still, you know, working through a lot of shit who wants to have intentional community with that bullshit. So I did my stuff like alone and I got rid of all of my stuff except for like um, I was going to be down to one pair of clothes. But I think I had like three or four by the time that I kind of like went out of that phase. But Mm. there was a couple of times that I moved and all of my stuff fit in the back of a minivan. And like the person Mm. who to me move was like, is that it? I'm like, yeah. And I was like proud of it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think think it's important to tag, like to go back um, and acknowledge that like, and e- even me, like, I still have blind spots about it, right? Because what I said was, like, I realized how deeply suburban I am. What I should have said was, in that moment, I realized how ready I was to access my privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. it is it is only through white privilege um, that I would, that we even had the credit card, you know, mm-hmm. the means to, like, go into debt for a $400 vet bill, mm-hmm. right? So... There's so much of that that's really icky to me now. Um, and that, like, I still have to be conscious and, like, acknowledge it. Because um, there was so much, like, playing poverty. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, this isn't, this is not right. a game. Yeah. This isn't, yes. uh, yeah. I, I can only imagine how offensive and upsetting and harmful and traumatic it must have seemed to our neighbors, like, to mm. people who would hear us talking about so self-righteously about all of the material things we were giving up um, because it's a privilege to be able to give those things up in the first place. Right. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. So that's like, yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. There's like this facade, like you always had a life, a life raft, you know, if, yes. if shit really hit the fan, you were going to be fine. Like, absolutely. You know, if shit hit the fan, sure. my yeah. parents lived with an extra bedroom and miles away, I knew we could go there at any time. It just, yep, yep. 
it was sure. simply um it was simply theater and yeah yeah you know, not that we intended it to be that way, but like intentions, um, are not as important as actions and impact. Um, so yeah, like it's a really, there was kind of a medium time, like a few years after where I would refer to it to that time, like really humorously. And like, it was like a quirky, funny thing about my past that was amusing to talk about with folks. But the, the further I get from it and the more, um, you know, the more I try to really listen to people in my life, um, like to the people of color in my life and people who are experiencing oppression, like the worse and worse I feel about it. And Mm -hmm. like, it's it's not cute anymore. It's not like a quirky, funny thing about me. It's, um, it's something that had like moments of good in it. Um, and certain parts and aspects of it that were valuable and meaningful, but most of it was pretty messed up. So what, what, how did it dissolve? Did it, did it fizz out? Did something blow up? How, what happened? Um, it mostly fizzed out over mm-hmm. the course of a couple years. Um, you know, we had a couple big like housemate fights about various things, but it, it just got less and less structured after we stopped pooling income Mm -hmm. and the last phase of it before, um, before we left that house and moved, um, moved to a different neighborhood in new Orleans. Um, and that was the last time we had housemates. So now we live in a single house. We don't live in a double. Mm -hmm. Um, the last phase was just being, landlords to our two friends that moved down um moved down from nashville to live in new orleans and just having like a really amicable uh you know normal housemate relationship (laughs) yeah normal like friendly landlord tenant housemate situation and that was like we're still great friends with those folks um so yeah it could have it could have ended much worse and i'm really glad Mm -hmm. that that yeah some of them go some of them get really ugly something really bad happens Somebody gets traumatized or murdered. Murdered. Murdered in the intentional communities. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, he is a was a male stripper, and he describes <laughs> what it was like with his other like stripper friends. And they all live together, and whenever he starts describing it to me, they pooled their income. They all lived together in the same house. They all threw their tips together. And I'm like. Yeah, Shay Clayboard would have been all over this shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, like, you just had, like, an uh, intentional yeah, they, community. Just so much I feel like else. they were lacking the purity culture aspect, but yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Brady. It can do without that anyway. It was probably way better that way. Absolutely. <laughs> Trust Everything's me, I... better without purity culture, yeah. Let me put it this way. If there was a reality show about... I would probably watch both reality shows, but there's one I'd watch more, and that was definitely the uh, intentional community with all the male strippers. <laughs> I'd watch yes. that religiously. And that's how you make your life yeah. decisions, right? If this was a reality show, would I watch it? Yeah, that's why, <laughs> That's how you make decisions, right? That's You're like, the, this is my reality. Do I want to watch it or not? You get, that's you no. got far. Yeah, you're casting... You're casting yourself for a part in a reality show. Um, Nikki, I have a question for you. So you have um, kind of overcome a lot of shit, childhood o- OCD, some anxiety, uh, purity culture, uh, living with uh, crust hippies. What did you call them? Crust punks. Crust punks. Crust punks. Crust punks. Yeah. Crust punks. Or crusties, yeah. Uh, you have lived through evangelical Portlandia, um, do you have any advice for our listeners or anybody of what they could be doing while they're deconstructing, um, anything? Yeah. Um, I think one of the, the most important things I learned as I was deconstructing was, you know, we talked a lot about inner voice and, and I had a lot of competing inner voices and had a lot of trouble deciphering them. Um, and so I learned like to stop looking for those mountaintops, stop of, of having these like lightning bolts of truth. Because mm. what I, what I realized was that that was not, that was not what truth looks like or sounds like, or feels like truth mm. is 
the thing that stays when the emotional oh. experience is over. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Word. You know, when the fear is over, when the, you know, when you walk out of the the Hell House theatrical thing, and it's like two days later. Um, truth is the is the stuff that stays after all of that, and that's been there the whole time. And that's that was the way that I was able to find my real moral center, my real inner voice. Um, and if there if there's anything left that that I would call God, that's what it would be. Um, is what's left is you. I like that. Shit. It's, it's the the stuff that stays that you realize has been there the whole time, because all of the other stuff I realized were were these lightning bolts of thoughts, like the OCD things, those intrusive thoughts. They come super quick and they just like fall into your brain. Um, and that's how I was taught to think about listening to God's voice as well as to like, wait, you know, and like clench your fists and close your eyes real tight and like, wait until a, a thought pops into your head and that's God speaking to you. Um, but it wasn't like that's indoctrination, indoctrination mm. speaking to you. So um. once, once I learned to like push all of the, the lightning bolt thoughts away and stop looking for, these like grand emotional fleeting experiences of, of, of total truth revelation that I used to like seek after so diligently and start just being comfortable sitting in that tension of not knowing and looking for the, the feelings and the thoughts and the beliefs that stay. Um, doing that, I think, has allowed me to, you know, I know y'all talked about like with religious trauma syndrome a a big symptom of that can be like a loss of meaning or, or feeling like you lost your whole identity and I think that that's been my the to use a, a Christianese phrase like the saving grace for me has been um truly feeling like myself after mm. all this um mm -hmm. because I you know I I filtered through everything else and the things that were left were the things that have always been with me, that have always been a part of me. Um, so that's what I'm left with. And that feels really good. Um, that like feels that. like, like a solid footing that I didn't have before. That's beautiful. Awesome. I love that. Well, Nikki, thanks so much. This was a, this was awesome. Thank you for, uh, that was really cathartic for me to talk about intentional community because I'd like never talk about it anymore for the same reason you do, where it's like, what was I, what the fuck what was going on? I yeah. mean, you know, obviously it made sense at the time, but. Uh, I'm definitely going to go remind Mark about gray water after this because I completely, <laughs> that must have been really traumatic because I totally forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for being yeah, on the show. Yeah, thank you. This um, was really awesome. I'm was really happy that I got the opportunity to, to talk about all this stuff. Yes. Yeah, Glad great. to have you. I uh, just want to remind all of our listeners, we do have a secret community on Facebook and also Skype where you can uh, deconstruct your faith. Slack, you said. Oh, um, oh Slack. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, Slack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> on Facebook and Slack, and uh, yeah, it's just such a ugly word. I really don't like that word. Um, I, I kind of quacked it. I sounded slack. like Yago. yeah, yeah, Slack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm all over anyway, the the point is the point is it's a safe space to process your deconstruction with other people that are going through it. Uh, there's nobody in there that's gonna, um, you know, uh, give you any kind of shit uh, they, for the, the feelings that you're having. Out. We'll kick their we'll kick their butts out of there. Yeah, we will kick their butts out. Um, we also have a Patreon. If you want to support us, uh, we can always use a little bit of funding for the show to keep it rolling uh, for travels and for um, you know our uh, online stuff. Um, and uh, and you know if you don't go to church, um, set Sunday is just a just second a Saturday. Second Saturday. Oh, Amen. and hey. Great review us on iTunes. Also, Bye -bye. leave us a review on iTunes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>